I find King Arthur movies are fascinating to cover because it's like books around the subject. It's a you know public figure. There's no copyright restrictions around it. You can generally go in and do anything you want with the character. And as a result, we've seen tons of super original ideas around King Arthur over the years. I mean, I could even argue like uh, Kinetic Yankee and King Arthur's Court going back to like Mark Twain or uh, Stephen R. Lawhead's uh, Pendragon Cycle. Um, we've seen lots of like really different takes. Um, even looking at, say, um, the Dark Tower series by Stephen King with the pistols being melted down from um, King Arthur's sword. You know, there's just tons of ways. Um, even, I think, even in uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time, uh, Arthur uh, was in there as well. Hawkwing, maybe? I forget the name. Anyway, lots of King Arthur mythologies, movies, tons of... I will watch all of them because I love the mythology of King Arthur. Um, even when they do something that's completely different to the way the characters are actually in the traditional stories, especially when, you know, I have this central theme of, like, Lancelot, Guinevere, and King Arthur. That's usually like a central plot point along with um, the sword, right? And there may be a Merlin figure. But 2004's uh, King Arthur took all of that and kind of threw it out the window and said, we're going to come up with our own version of this, and we're going to have this be all about these Roman soldiers versus the original uh, Britons, right? The the the, the essentially Celts, Druid-based um, peoples, um, and we're gonna we're gonna do this in a completely different way, and it's gonna be more of a a sword and sandal type film as opposed to a sword and sorcery film. And for the most part, it works. It did not get a lot of praise at the time it came out. I think I remember I remember when it came out. I've seen it a few times over the years, but Chris and I had never watched it uh, together. Uh, in recent years. I mean, it, we think we watched it when we were dating. Um, but I remember it being very controversial when it came out because, and, and there was some reasons I didn't use that image here. Uh, one, of the, one of the marketing images used in the U.S. was Kira Knightley with a bow, you know, shooting towards the frame. And uh, it's very controversial because in that photo, she has much larger breasts than she has in real life. And she got very upset about the fact that the U.S. marketing team did that because it was basically saying it's not okay to be a woman, 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 small breasts. And she's a great actress, and I totally agree with her on that. Absolutely. If you're going to promote an actress or actor in the material for your film, it needs to be the actor or actress. They could be in the, in the character makeup and everything else, but don't enhance their breasts or enhance their muscles or things like that. That's just... Ah. But anyway, King Arthur. Uh, let's talk about this movie. It is a fun movie if you like sword films. Um, I watched the director's cut is the one that we're reviewing, which I think is way better than the original theatrical version. Uh, and I think the, the one of the big takeaways from here, having, having not watched this in... Man, it's probably been 10 years since I've seen this film. 8 or 10 years. I know we watched it when we were dating... But that's been forever ago, so at least eight or ten years ago is the last time I watched this. And I've seen a lot of movies and TV shows since then, and the few things that struck me immediately were, holy crap, this movie has a stacked cast in terms of uh, actors and actresses. So just to go down the list, we've got Clive Owen as Arthur, Ian Griffith as Lancelot, um... Mads Mikkelsen as Tristan, Joel Edgerton as Gawain, Hugh Dancy as Galahad, Ray Winston as Borges, Ray Stevenson, R.I.P. as Dagonet, Keira Knightley as Guinevere, Stephen Delane as Merlin, who I was like, where did I see him? And then I was like, oh yeah, Game of Thrones. Um, Stellan Skarsgård as Serdic, Till Schwieger as, as, as Cynic, his son. And then beyond there, we just get into this list of, of other actors who are lesser named actors but it's just a huge even the very beginning of the shot Graham McTavish has this like little cameo it was probably when it was really early in his career as like the soldier who comes to recruit the kids and I was like that's Graham McTavish and I was hoping he was gonna be in the rest of the film and that he was that was it he was just there for a couple of minutes um but the the, the big thing here too especially if you've gone on since then and you've watched um I think it was called Hannibal they did a show around Hannibal Lecter's character and Mads Mikkelsen played Hannibal Lecter, and um, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's in here on the list. Let me go find him again. Hugh Dancy as um, uh, the FBI agent, right? 
uh, who's hunting him down. And and I like saw these two on screen. I was like, they totally work together. You know, like 20 years later, more like probably 15 years later on on Hannibal. Um, just a ton of actors in this film who were in like the early stages of their supporting role um, careers before they all and all of those actors have gone on to become leading men and women in their careers since then like everybody in this film it's just it is a stacked cast of people who were at the beginning stages of getting out there and getting great supporting roles and the case of some of them they've been doing it for like way winston but like ray stevenson was just coming off of rome at this point um and kira knightley was just getting going clive owens was just getting you know becoming famous mads bickelson was in the early stages of his film career like all of these actors were you know coming out and 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 doing great things at the time but they were mostly in supporting roles and then this this is kind of what the film that where they were all coming together and right before they all kind of blew up and went on and had their own successful um maybe not necessarily a-list careers but definitely leading man careers so um it is a good film with good music, I like the Roman twist where it's all about these characters being part of this group of soldiers who were underneath uh, Clive Owen's character as Arthur. Now, the switch here is, you know, Arthur is like born into it. He's born into it as an officer. And the other guys are conscripted because their families owed a debt of allegiance to the Roman soldiers. Um that part of it makes them sort of feel like a band of outlaws, so to speak, but they're not really outlaws just per se. They're just like mercenary soldiers underneath a Roman soldier who's not really Roman because he's Roman in Britain at the same time. And there's obviously been these battles going on between them and the Britons who live there, um, the Wodes, they call them, in this film. And then, of course, you have the invading um, Norsemen who are led by Skellen Skarsgård's character, and there's sort of this triple threat going on and at the end of the film it is mostly about the Wodes and you know the Britons and the Romans coming together against the uh, Norsemen to defend their land. Uh, Skellen Skargar's decision and I don't know if this was his decision actually or if it was the director's decision to have him act in such a way that he just never looks anybody in the eye really. He's always sort of like above them and so he's always just kind of talking over here take care of that for me and I'm going to, you know, he might look at you direct when he's like, I'm going to kill you. But for the most part, it's just, he's always kind of sort of like aloof and acting as if he's a part of it as he's very important. And, and you know, this, this character. And I, I would love to know if that was his decision or the director's decision um, to do this. What I didn't know about this film until I was actually reading up on this after I watched it the other night was, Anton Fuqua directed this, right? And I didn't remember the fact that he directed this. But what was very interesting to me was he publicly has stated that this was like one of the worst films he ever made in his life because Disney wouldn't let him they wouldn't leave him alone. So apparently he signed on to make he signed on to make an R-rated movie. And he got midway through shooting. Like I've read various reports like halfway, 30% halfway through shooting. And Disney, who was distributing and also producing through Touchstone, I believe at the time, and Jerry Bruckheimer, um, but Buena Vista Distribution, which is Disney, came in and said, yeah, you're going to have to tone down the violence and you're going to have to – You we, we, need this, we need these changes to happen because we're not happy with the direction this film is going. And he said that was when he just was like, oh, now my creative vision has been snipped. And all these shots I've set up and the storyboards I've created and all these sets I've built and the plans I had to do these epic fight scenes, now I'm being told that I can't do any of that because you want me to have less blood and violence. Um, that was something I did not know, so I thought it was an interesting piece of trivia about this film. Um, overall, I feel like most of it was pretty fun, especially when we talk about the character acting that's going on between all the different characters who are the knights in um, this Quick commercial break, everyone, to celebrate and give thanks to all of these amazing people who keep me on the air full time. Really appreciate the support. All you got to do is join as a member. You get access to private videos. You can also do super thanks on any upload or super chats and stickers on any live stream or premiere you see. And beyond that, don't forget we're multi-streaming over on Twitch now, so you can support over there as well. Thanks so much to everybody. Let's get back to the video at hand. Band. The round table thing felt like it was just thrown in there because it was like, oh, look, Arthur has a round table because he believes that no man should be considered, you know, above someone else. They all need to be equal. Um, it was thrown in there. There is no Guinevere seducing Lancelot plot here or Lancelot choosing to seduce Guinevere. 
Um, it's all about everybody being loyal soldiers to Arthur and him dealing with this fact that they're all supposed to be given their freedom after this 15-year campaign. And at the last minute, this priest comes in and says, oh, no, you have to go rescue this family from deep in enemy territory. And only then will you be granted your freedom. And it turns this relationship that all of them had with the Romans from being somewhat lukewarm to just outright hateful. It's like, well, screw you. You know, we've been free men since we were born. You know, and it reeks of, you know, watching Braveheart and freedom. Um, but overall, if you can get past that kind of stuff, and also there are a few lines of dialogue mostly related to Clive Owen's character, where he gives these speeches about how it's either a speech about God or a speech about honor or a speech about, you know, whatever. He gives these grand speeches that sometimes feel like they're out of place. And I have to wonder how much of that was on the producers of the film rather than Anta Fuqua. Um, because he basically had creative control stripped away from him. And they don't necessarily feel that great. One of the reasons I always love um, Ridley Scott's uh, Sword and Sandal films is there's not usually a lot of grandstanding by any one character, which is why we get these three-hour epic arcs, because everybody's getting sort of equal screen time. Which, by the way, Kingdom of Heaven is totally a movie I should do soon, even though Chris and I have seen that film like three times over the years. It's a great movie, and a great example of, of like a sword and sandal epic film, um, where I don't remember there being any grandstanding in there, I just remember there being you know, a really good movie that plays out over several hours. Um, anyway, this is a fun movie. It's not necessarily the best movie you're ever going to watch, but I do feel it's a solid sword and sandal uh, sort of epic. The directorial release is like two hours plus, I think. It says 142 minutes. So the theatrical release was 126, and you get about another extra, what, 15 minutes or so of runtime in the director's cut, uh, which is what I watched to review this. And I love it. It's a good movie. I would happily watch it again. I think it's definitely something I've, I, you know, I've, I've watched it three or four times since it came out, and I'll probably go back and watch it you know, in another four or five years and get enjoyment out of it again. So especially it's really cool seeing all these actors in these early stages. Like I'd complete, I knew Ray Stevenson was in it and Ray Winston, but I had forgot that Joel Edgerton was in it. I knew Mads Mikkelsen was in it, but I had forgot Hugh Dancy and Ian Grufford. Um, you know, all of these characters who I've seen go off and do other things. I was like, hey, hang on a second. Especially when I saw Mads and Hugh together, I was like, hey, those guys did Hannibal together. And, and I completely, even, even when I saw Hannibal, I never put it together because I hadn't watched this movie in so long that I just completely forgot about it. Anyway, fun movie. I'd give it like a 7.5 out of 10 for pure enjoyment. Maybe even an 8 out of pure enjoyment. You know, the, the, the two points getting docked off is mostly for a few lines of kind of cheesy dialogue, like where it's like they're grandstanding about topics that just feel out of place. And some of the things where they just kind of threw in an element of King Arthur's mythology, like the character of Merlin just being the leader of the of the Brits, you know, and he's like a druid, you know, but he's just like, there's no magical element to druid, to, to Merlin at all. He's just there. The sword is kind of like, instead of being this really cool magical sword, it's just a sword forged from the iron of Britain and handed down over the generations, you know, and so, you know, still a good movie, worth your time. Love to hear your thoughts on it. Drop them down below. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.